Welcome to the Fiction Addiction Podcast, a podcast where we go one-on-one with fiction creators, such as authors, filmmakers, actors, songwriters, and more. Each episode, we get the inside scoop on our guests' creative process, the ups and downs of their industries, and our guests also give out tips and tricks that help them become successful. And now, let's jump into the episode with your host, Chris C.L. Lowry. All right, all right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Fiction Addiction Podcast. My next guest was born and raised in my city, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yes, sir. He graduated from Philadelphia Central High School, and then he spent a few years at Howard University. He started writing in middle school and has never stopped. He is a multi-genre author with books ranging from young adult to middle grade to what he calls truthful narrative fiction. He self-published all of his works. His first published book was a book of poetry back in 2016, which was a compilation of works ranging from his college years to the present. His most recent work is the second in the Uncomfortable Conversation series, The Police in the Community, which is a look at the interaction of the police with the people they are supposed to protect and serve through both the eyes of the police and the community. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Morrow, what is going on, sir? Not much. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, man. Thank you for st- stopping by on the podcast. So let's jump right into your journey. Um, you began writing in middle school. Um, what about writing grabbed your attention at such a young age? So for me, it was a so I probably first started writing. I remember vividly. I was in seventh grade. I was a new kid, new school. I ain't know nobody. So actually, my first thing I ever wrote was like, I used to write raps back in the day. I used to write rhymes. So that was the first thing I ever <laughs> did. And it was just out of boredom and also just a way to express myself, way to, you know, relieve some stress, way to get some tension off, get some, just release without doing harm to nobody. Right. <laughs> so at that type of age, besides uh, rap, what else were you writing? Uh, I mean, probably then. That's really all I was writing. Okay. Then as I got old, then as I got older, I started writing myriad of stuff. I would just write down whatever was on my mind. Like I didn't write journals or nothing like that. But if I'm in class and I'm bored, I write something down. Or um, as I got older, uh, I see something and I write it down. I just kept notepads, and all kinds of stuff. I just I mean, I guess back then I didn't know what I was doing, but I guess it was a start of little, you know, little, little short stories or little thoughts or just something that I saw that I like, like, oh, yeah. Or, you know, I'm a heterosexual male. So I was, you know, I hear something. I'm like, oh, I can use that to hit on shorty. uh, Right. It would be be anything. (laughs) So you um, did you continue rapping um, as you got older? Probably all the way through college. Once I got to college, I realized I wasn't going to pay the bills. Uh, <laughs> so then that just escalated to other things. So, but I mean, even though like those writing the rhymes was that led to poetry, which led to other things. Mm. So that was just the beginning of beginning of like you call the journey. Right. So once you start, uh, obviously you start at a young age, but once you develop your craft, um, and you were maturing through college, what was the vision when it came to writing? So, cause obviously you had the, like you said, if you were, if you were, if you were spitting and then you had the vision that, Hey, all right, this ain't working out. I got to do something else. Obviously when it came to writing, um, what was your journey? What was the plan for you at that time? You know what? I really didn't have a plan, at least for writing that came later on, but I always had friends that was, um, see the poems or see the stories, and they'd always be like, "D, you gotta, you gotta do something with this. Um, you gotta." Especially when I was in college, when I was at Howard, uh, I had a friend of mine. What's up, Leilani? She um, would always tell me all the time, "D, you gotta write, you gotta do something with this." So you gotta, and she stayed on me for twenty years, fifteen years, Damn. however long it was. <laughs> Every time, yo, D, did you do something with that? Did you do something with that? So she was the one that actually made me put together that first book which led to this. So I didn't grow up, I mean, growing up all through school, you know, then I had a kid and all that other stuff. 
then life hits you. So all of those dreams you had mm-hmm. got shifted to the side. You know, <laughs> right. I, I got a kid to take care of. I got, you know, bills to pay. But always in the back of my mind, her telling me, yo, you got to stay with it. And, that, and my wife now, she always, she bought me a computer and she bought me this. And she was like, you got to do this. You got to do this, though. Damn. That's really what it was. So how how important was that, that support, that that motivation from uh, your friends and your wife to what now became a, a, a writing career for you? Um, it's very important. I think for anybody, no matter the age or, you know, if you in school, out of school, you 50 years old, but starting when little kids, when, when you were a little kid, anybody, I mean, you from Philly, you know, you know mm-hmm. what it is. You know, you know what these, what it's like out there right now, but for anybody to be successful, it's going to be somebody that pushes them. It's going to be somebody right. to point them in the right direction. And it's going to be somebody like, no, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that because can't nobody really stop you from doing anything. But they can be like, look, you got talent. You need to do this. You got talent. You need to do that. It's always. um, It's very important just to. Because you get a certain amount of self-motivation from self. But when somebody else recognizes the talent that you have and they just back you up, I mean, that's that hopefully pushes you to another level. Right, definitely. And I think a lot of times we focus on um, the person and, and like say they, they have this uh, focus on this and focus on that. But we don't we off, we often need to be the same way with the support system. You know what I mean? Because yeah, well, for every for, for every person that is saying, hey, you should be doing this, you should be doing this. You have you do have more people watching somebody with talent, watching somebody waste their talent and not saying anything. You know what I mean? And that motivation that that them stepping up and saying something to them could be that motivation, but they're not. So what would you like? What would you say to somebody that's a support system that has somebody talented in their life and they want them, especially for us, like being in the city, they want them to stay on the right path because we know what the uh, end result could be. Um, So what I would say is anytime you see something, anytime you see somebody with a talent, you should, whether it's something small, sometimes just saying, yo, I really like that, or you're really good, something that small, and then going all the way to, you know, um, helping them push their career or saying, I, yo, I got somebody that I need to introduce you to that may help you. But anything that's going to take somebody to another, that's going to take them a step down that path is as beneficial as it comes. If, like what you're doing now, you reached out to me, was like, yo, uh, I like your work. I think you should be on the podcast. Hopefully, you know, just to open up another door. And hopefully right, once that door gets open and I can walk through it, I can bring somebody else with me. Mm. So anytime, anything that's beneficial to one can be beneficial to all. And anytime yeah. that we as a people can help the next person along, I mean, whether it's our people, whether it's white people, Asian people, no matter who it is, if you see somebody with talent, and you can bring them along. You never know that how many other people that person is going to bring them. Along. Right. So you don't know, you know, you think you just throwing a rock in the ocean, but that rock is spread, you know, all those ripples, all of that. Any any kind of positive motivation is great. And yeah, needed, yeah, like absolutely. you said. Absolutely. And we all we all need that little push. We all need that, you know, or you not doing what you're supposed to be doing. We all need that kick in the ass. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, I don't know if I'm cursed. I apologize. No, but... hell yeah, man. No, we straight. <laughs> so you um, and I see this a lot. I'm seeing this a lot now. You're a multi-genre author, um, young adult, middle grade, the truthful narrative fiction. What is like? How did you get into? What was the first one you 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 ever wrote? Uh, uh, what was the first the first one? Wrote? So the first one was the book of poetry, but that was years and years in the making but so the first actual book was um a book called heaven's rain it's about uh this young lady who is she's a half angel so her dad is an angel and her pop is a i mean i got that backwards (laughs) no i said it right her dad is an angel and her mom is just a human being so it's like a sci-fi 
uh, story, and it has more to it than that. But that genre for, all right, let me say it this way, for Black people, mostly what you see for us in written material is one of two things. It's either romance or Mm -hmm. it's super gangster. And me personally, I I just can't write even one of those things. (laughs) Um. What like why not not like because obviously you 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 from you from the city uh yeah. you seen both so obviously you know all about it so why 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 wasn't that um why wasn't there a connection there with the with the street lit and the romance so the the romance stuff I just can't like I, I'm I'm exaggerating but I just can't write I call it um, word porn I just I don't know I just can't do it I just can't bring myself <laughs> to it. I just can't you know the Fifty Shades of Grey and all that I just can't. I, I don't know, just something in me that won't let me do that. And the other <laughs> stuff, I think the uh, the the street lit, I like it. I've read it. I just can't write it. I see enough of it. It's just so there's other avenues. Like when you watch a movie, uh, you watch The Godfather, one of the greatest movies ever made. But when black people mm-hmm. make a movie like The Godfather, it's not seen in that same light. Right. Right. So yeah, we yeah. also we also don't tend to fall out of these categories like um, Harry Potter. Just take Harry Potter. Harry Potter sold 100 million copies of what made that lady a billionaire. And then you got Star Wars. He sold that for four billion. <laughs> like some numbers is crazy. So my thing is, all right, it's not a whole lot of us in those categories. Why try and write something? Why force something out of me? To fall into a category where there's a thousand other black authors that's doing that. So let me see right, if right. I can fall into this lane over here where the potential is billions. Mm-hmm. So, so how was that journey? Once you 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 put the pen to paper, you had your um manuscript completed. What was your next step? Did you think about going traditional? Did you always know you want to do it uh independent? Like what was the next step? So the next step, trying to find a uh, a literary agent, trying to find somebody to represent you, all of that stuff. But um, nowadays, it's just like music. If you want to be a rapper or a singer, 20 years ago, you had to have talent. Somebody would come find you. You would have A&R. They would build you up. Nowadays, if you want to be a singer or a rapper, you got to go to YouTube. You already got to have a built-in audience. Mm-hmm. They don't care how good you are. Because nobody, these record labels, they don't want to do the work. So I found it to be the same way with this genre, with books and print. They don't care how good you are. I mean, some people will take a manuscript and some people will take a a flyer on some unknown. Most of them, first thing you don't know, how many followers do you have? What's your social right. media presence? What's all of this? What's all of that? And at that time, I didn't know none of that. So I had no, I had none of that. I had my own... <laughs> I had my own personal, you know, my own personal Instagram, my own personal this and that, but I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't know I needed to build up a fan base before somebody would take a shot on me. So I just, I just put it out there and then I just started doing everything on my own, you know, do some research, do this, do that, figure out what you can here and there. Now, do you think, um, the social media in terms of, uh, the writing world, do you think that's a positive or has it become a negative for writers coming up? Um, oh, that is a good question. I think, I think it's what, whatever you make of it. I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. Everybody would like to be the next big person. Everybody want to be the next Stephen King or the next JK Rawlings or this person or that mm-hmm. person. And that's the dream of everybody. But then once you, I mean, you, I, I didn't know these things going into it, but once you get into it, you realize there's 100,000 people that want to be writers. Yeah. There's another 100,000 people <laughs> that actually wrote a book and don't know what the next steps are. So mm-hmm. you, you're in competition with all these other people. And then it's a shame to say, and it hopefully one day it won't be this way, but as a black male author, it was it's even harder to get somebody's attention. Now, what do you I think mean, that is? Not a lot of us. It's just not a lot of us. You probably couldn't name outside of uh, outside of celebrities. 
and then whoever you came across on your own, you probably couldn't name right. a famous non-celebrity black author. All right. And that's because because there's no because that's not out there. People are afraid to jump on something that's new. If you run in a business, you wanna you don't wanna take that chance on some unknown if I got a sure thing here. So no matter how good you are, it's like, do I can I put all my money into this not knowing what I'm going to get out? And that's scary for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Now now with the black male writers, um and black writers in general, who do you think is to blame for uh the lack of success? You know what I mean? Because it's um in, in speaking about black male writers in general, it's some guys out there that are like dope that I think are dope as hell. When I came up um uh writing and then I started running into the work like Jaquavis Coleman, Quan, um they their work is like to me top notch, can go neck to neck up there with a, a James Patterson thriller and things like that. Mm-hmm. Who do you think is to, and I don't even think, and then the one thing is, uh, even with Ashley and Jaquavis, their, um, their collaborative books, the cartel series, it wasn't even like that, that street lit of, oh, the gang banging. This is, it was really a good storyline behind it. It, it, it could, it could have been a movie. It still can be a movie. Each book. Who do you think is to blame, uh, for the lack of success? Do you think black authors get enough, uh, support from the black community or writing community in general? Well, I think there's so many answers to that. And I'm going to answer this in like a bunch of different ways. The first thing is most, most people now, let's just be honest. Most people now don't read. They going to listen to the podcast. They going to watch the movies. They don't read as much as they did 20 years ago. Right. So that's the first problem. First problem is people just don't read like like we used to. The second thing is all of those authors, I know those authors you mentioned, but outside of the literary world, how many people know who those guys are? So the the mechanisms that help those guys get pushed aren't there. Mm. And then the last part of that is a lot of um right now in our community, we don't read as much as we need to, in my opinion. So we're not supporting all of these authors. So you know who they are because you're a literary person and you're into books and you're into expanding your mind and expanding your horizons. But come on, these young kids don't read. All right. These young kids rather do whatever it is that they out there doing than wanting to read. And now if somebody the easiest way for them, for those guys to get themselves, hopefully, would be some kind of visual, like make a movie out of it. Mm-hmm. Make a, if, and I'm not saying it's their fault, and I'm not trying to put no blame or no pressure on none of these guys because they're doing what they think, but if the Will Smiths and the um, Kevin Hart's and the, or the uh, Tyler Perry's, if they would reach back into that community and put those guys on screen then those those black those other male black voices it would be easier for them to be heard because now once somebody sees them oh that's his movie oh okay he got right. other book okay now let me go back and read these books so so why do you think it doesn't happen that often and i and i and i say that to say uh when tyler perry opened his studio um and I, like I said, I don't, I don't know him obviously uh, to say uh, how he went about it, what, what, what financial backing he had, investors, or anything like that. But it didn't seem like, or I didn't hear about all those people that were invited investing in the studio to help him. You know what I mean? So, and he, you're talking about when he had that premiere, you're talking about billions of black dollars that were in the building. So wh- why do you think? He had to do it himself instead of everybody. Like, what do you, th- where do you think the disconnect is in terms of even our black celebrities uh, investing in each other? 
So I, I don't I don't want to put no I don't want to say nothing bad about that man because that man came up from the from nothing from living in nothing. his car, right? From living in his car, pushing his uh his at that time screenplay I mean uh theater plays to what he is now. So I'm so some people probably did invest. You know, Oprah probably gave him some money, and some other people probably gave him some money, and. You can't, I don't think it's fair of us to say, to go to that man and say, you need to be doing this. We don't know what he's doing. We don't know. It's like I said, there's 10,000, 100,000 authors out there. He may not, he can't reach out to all 100,000 people, but he can reach out to 10. And I'm pretty sure that he probably will in his own time and all of that. Um, But we just, it can't be just Tyler Perry. That's, I think that's the problem. If you, if you, uh, whoever and you're trying to get a movie produced there's hundreds of uh white production companies white movies yeah, uh, there's everywhere for us, <laughs> for us there's tyler perry now you got kevin hart doing his thing will smith i mean it's less than 10 and no matter how many people they reach back to it's still not going to have the same reach that this that the other you know mach- white machine had mm-hmm and I don't want to call it like a white machine. Like I don't, you know, I'm not putting no blame on them for what they're doing because they're trying to make money. At the end of the day, right. we it's looking at it as it's a business. So whether he wants, if you a businessman, and you see Derek on one side, and you see, uh, I don't know, famous actor so and so, you gonna go with that guy because he's gonna make you more bread than Derek is. Right, you are gonna get more money in your pocket. So. I don't know. It's it's a we gotta we gotta more people gotta walk the path that I think Tyler Perry did. He started from nothing and he built up his empire. We just need more people to do the same thing. That way we get more outreach, we get more chances, we get more people reaching back. If one person can reach back and reach ten people, then we need ten people reaching out to a hundred people, and then it'll start right. to spread. One man can't do you it think- all. Right. You think we got that? What you mean? That type of support. And like like for writers, you think we help each other enough? Um, probably not. I mean, no. I, I don't think we do. I don't think we we don't have the No, I'm uh I'm speaking for me, I don't think we do. And 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 whole, like mm-hmm. I probably in in the years I've been writing, I probably been reached out more by more people that are not black than are black people. That's a fact, <laughs> and that's crazy to like, me. And it's crazy, yeah. Oh, seriously, it's crazy. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I definitely agree with you. Uh, because like literally same here. You know what I mean? When you go places and same here. Uh, and then it's crazy because they you see black people say, oh, we don't have enough stories for the, the youth and this, this, and this from our people. But I'm looking out there, I'm like, we do. Like, you know what I mean? It's just not being supported. Like, if you look for it, you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> it's literally. I, 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 I saw something the other day. There's a, a lady, that's I forgot her name, and I should remember, but she's a doctor in California, UCLA Med School, I believe. And she wrote a children's book. Like, now you got oh, somebody, and if you read her story, it was crazy. She got turned down at a couple of places, the school that she really wanted to go to. Then she got into the one of the best medical schools in the country. Now she's a pediatric something, excuse me for not remembering. And now she's writing a children's book. But how many people know mm. about that? Right. I mean, Literally. outside of <laughs> outside of Oprah, Kevin Hart, Will Smith, Tyler Perry, you know, what, what, who, who do we have? Yeah, right. So they out there, we just don't. It's just not. It's just not focused on. You know what I mean? There's no right. spotlight on them for some for some odd reason. I don't know why, but it just so doesn't somehow, seem like there's a spotlight on them. But like doing what you're doing, and I see you reaching out to. Um, I, I I I read. I mean, I watched the first couple. Of, I mean, I listened to the first couple of podcasts. I'm gonna listen to them all. So I love what you're doing, reaching out, putting a putting a spotlight oh, on this person, putting a spotlight on that person. 
And we actually know a few, a few of the same people because I see you uh, with Film Mob. Oh, yeah, Chop. Shout out to Chop Mosley, man. <laughs> yeah, I know Chop Pop. I coached his little brother. Oh, snap. So. Yeah, and that's crazy because the, the uh, there's a bunch of people in, in Philly, and that's crazy when they, when they talk about these studios and stuff like that because Chop uh, opened his studio, the Film Mob Studios, I think Inferno Studios, got the um, he had the rap, stu- the music studio, and then he also got video. Uh, shout out to Flashworks. He got a video and photography podcast studio. So I see it's crazy because you see uh the like the youngins and like you know what I mean? The young the young guys that that are doing stuff that you couldn't do 20 years ago. You know what I mean? You imagine right. a, a, a a young boy that picked up a camera, had a vision, uh however, wherever uh chop started, and then all of a sudden years later he got his own studio. You know what I mean? That that was like impossible years and years ago like to even think that you can do that on your own but yeah i'm just hoping like people support them you know what i mean keep that stuff moving because it's needed you know what i mean yeah but i also think that what he's doing and what you're doing and what others is doing like you said 20 years ago we didn't think we could do that because we didn't see nobody doing it doing it right exactly So now like my son's age group and the age group under him they looking at people and they's like oh okay I see he can, he's doing this and he's doing this. I can run my own business and I can do this. And like the networking that you're saying that we don't have is starting to happen. It's slowly mm-hmm. coming together because you got more and more people doing more and more things. It's just, it's just going to take a little bit of time for us to get there. Right. So break down truthful narrative fiction. All right. So truthful narrative fiction, what it is, is those two books, there's two books. Um, an unfortunate conversation. What those two books are is you take real world topics. So real truthful conversations that people had. And what I did was, so the first book is just an uncomfortable conversation. And that book, you got a white guy from this area from up north and a white guy from down south. They get into a little thing online and then they sit down and they have an honest hard conversation. Now, the truthful part of it is in that book, in both of those books, every word in that book is an actual true conversation that was truly had by some people somewhere. I was either part of the conversation or I heard the conversation or, but the fiction part comes in because I took 50 stories and combined them into just two people. Mm. Same thing with the one about the police. Every word in that book has been uttered by a person. So nothing in there is false. But the fiction part of it comes in just the the narrative that I put together to, you know, to visualize what they actually say. So when you read that book, you got the police talking about people talking to people in the community. So every word that was uttered by the police in that book has been uttered by actual policemen or women. And the words that was uttered by the community are words that was actually uttered by people. So you're talking hundreds of conversations that I can buy that I compiled into this uh, fictional narrative. That's the book. So that's why I call it truthful fiction It's truthful because every word it was actually said, every word is somebody's truth. And the fiction right. is just, the, you know, instead of 80 people talking, there's two people talking or seven people talking. Right. And that's deep because, um, we're going to dive into the book uh, now, uh, Un- Uncomfortable Conversation, the Police in the Community. Uh, it was interesting. The, the layout, the the narrative, it was different. You know what I mean? It was different. It was real. It just seemed like, because like you said, there, there, there are conversations. It seemed like you're there. You know what I mean? In the middle of the conversation, you're listening. You're, you're, you're in, in, in a way, because like you said, it's everyone's truth. In a way, you know what questions should be asked and they're asked in the book. And you're like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? You get yeah. that sense of like reassurance that, oh yeah, the, the, like these are, but, but you may not depend on what, what, what side of the coin you are on or what side of the, 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 the fence. You may not know the answer, but you'll get it when you read this book. You know what I mean? So if Thank you me. have a police officer that knows a question, but hasn't gotten the answer because of whatever outlet they have or do not have, they, they can read this and okay, or oh, this is what people are thinking. So, 
uh, uncomfortable conversation book to police in the community is an unfiltered conversation between the police and members of the community they serve a conversation where no topics are off limit a conversation in which each party must face the truth on how they are perceived a true yet respectful conversation aiming to look at the relationship between the police and the community they serve so what was the inspiration behind this book all right so the, the first book i wrote um I had a lady reach out to me from Texas. She had a, she has a brother that's a cop. So in that book, I go in part of that conversation. There was a little bit talking about the police in the first book. And she hit me up and she was like, you got to write a book. She had her brother read it. And her brother was like, he got to write a whole book. And she probably for like a year, every couple of months, she would send me a DM or something like, yeah, you going to write that book? You going to write that book? So I finally sat down and I wrote it just, and when I wrote it, I had her in the back of my mind. And I mm. also, I also got friends that are cops. I got real life was at my wedding, good friends that are cops and I'm from Philly. So I got friends that's on the other side too. And then I got right. friends that's, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I got friends that's just, you know, regular good people and not saying that either one of those two people, one of those two types of people ain't good people. I'm just saying, you know, hard work and every day go to nine to five trying to pay their bills. Right, mind, mind their business. Like. <laughs> right. So I think part of the problem is when people talk about a certain situation, they only talk about it from, they, from their perspective. They never want to see what the other side got to say. So what I try to do with this book is say, okay, here's what you're thinking, but here's what the other side is thinking also. So I need you to see how you would how your actions and your words affect the other side and vice versa. Mm. So one of the things in the book is um, talking about just percentages. So I say, if you take a thousand people, no matter what demographic that is, all of those thousand people ain't going to be decent people. Whether they a thousand males, a thousand females, a thousand black people, a thousand excuse me, a thousand Asian people, a thousand cops, 99% of them is going to be good people, but it's always going to be that bad apple in the bunch. So whether you a cop and you think oh, I'm going down, I'm going down North, I'm about tired of this. No, most of the people down North is good, decent people. Mm -hmm. Or most of the people in this neighborhood is good, decent people. But you put in, you taking these two or three criminals you locking up and you putting their behavior on a on the whole neighborhood, that's not fair. The same thing the other way. Just because this one cop shot somebody don't mean all the cops is bad cops. Right. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be bad cops. Yeah, there's bad cops out there, but all of them ain't bad. So we do too much taking the minimum or taking a small amount and applying that narrative to the whole. And that's not fair to either side. And I just want to, so I wrote that book to make sure that everybody sees what the other side is going through. Mm. And that's crazy because like you said, they, the, the minimum is taken and judgment is cast upon the whole group, but it is, is crazy because that's what happened to uh, black people, period in America. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That people, people have encounter with one or not even in, in this, the, the crazy thing is some people don't even have encounters. You know what I mean? They go by what they hear. They go by what was perceived back in the day in terms of media. You know, like you said, cause every story wasn't positive. It was always gang banging. It was always, and I see the, um, the Latinos stepped up. I, it might've been, I don't think it was last year. I think it was a few years ago. And they said, listen, can y'all stop giving us these gang banging roles? Like we do more than that. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, it, it's it's people are now starting to see, hey, we don't even want to play these roles anymore because it is uh, being stereotyped upon our people after people who don't have encounters with our race uh, are now judging based off what they see in movies and what they see on TV. You know what I mean? Not not realizing it's fiction. It's played up most of the time, but they, they take it as fact. and think everybody acts like that so why do you think in terms of the black community why do you think something that happens to us in terms of stereotyping the whole group we then in turn do to police officers off of one person's action um because it's easy 
it's the easiest thing to do is to be like, yo, this cop did this, or yo, this person did that. And I think it's also, it was done to us, so now we're doing it mm-hmm. back. Mm. I, I, I told my buddy, my friend of mine, who's a cop, I said, it's a shame, but y'all should understand that. And y'all are now being stereotyped the same way, maybe not you, but your brothers in blue stereotyped the whole neighborhood. I, I said it right. just it just came back. It's, it's not fair, but it, the same thing y'all did to us is now being done to y'all. So mm. I think that's one. People just got fed up with it. Like all, uh, if you if I'm walking down the street and you harassing me for no reason, then I'm looking at the same way you looking at me at the color of my skin. I'm looking at you at the color of your skin, which is just a blue. Whether you black, white, female, Asian, whatever. Once you put that uniform, you're blue. And it, it, it's not fair to everybody, but what they did to us wasn't fair either. Right. And then it's just lazy. Instead of the same way you, as a man, when you approach somebody, you're not going to look at him based on whatever demographic. You look, you're going to look at that man as that man. Right. Hell yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is your opinion on the state of the relationship between the police and the community across the nation? It's terrible. Now in 2020. Is absolutely terrible. And there's so many parts to it. I mean, the first thing is, and I hate when people say this, um, when when people, when black people call black cops sellouts or something like that, and I tell them all the same thing. Imagine if there was no black cop. Right. Imagine how bad it would be. <laughs> I don't think that. <laughs> that's, that's slave days, basically. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 you, so that's the first thing we need to stop. Like, we need to stop with calling the black cops sellouts. We need those guys and, and women on the inside. We need Latino women and males on the inside. That way, they can start to understand, you know, all black people ain't bad people or whatever it is. But it can't be just an all white. Because like you said, now we're going to look if. If every cop was white, we would look at them like some kind of slave masters, some kind of, you know, extradition force or something. Right. And then we'll complain that there are no minor, you know what I mean? And then complain about exactly. that when, when we, when we do have our own, we uh, don't appreciate them um, and then lump them into categories. And it's crazy because th- that that's one of the quotes I saw in the book that I highlighted. It was like, it, it's strictly, you, you said uh, there are people in your own community that hate you because you're black and you're a cop. But those same people never in a million years would would they want an all white and all male police force. So why, in terms of the people, when they go out calling these cops sellouts and Uncle Toms and all that stuff, why do you think there is a why do you think the vision is so unclear for the community when they attack these guys for no reason in regards to what they want from public servants, basically? I think the other part of the problem with the police is when the police do, I think the way they react to situations is wrong. And what I mean by that is when a police officer does something wrong, they close ranks around that person. And instead of saying, okay, Officer Smith was dead wrong. We're going to fire Officer Smith. We're going to do this. Nah, they they close ranks and be like, Officer Smith didn't do nothing wrong. And we like, yeah, we got it on video. Yeah, he right. shot him in the back for no reason. And they like, ah, that's nothing. There's other, they always trying to explain it and defend it instead of just saying he's wrong we're going to fire him that will go a long way to fixing the problem that we have and then the second part of that the relationship we have with the cops is a lot of the times you talking about young kids that don't know no better they out there doing whatever they doing, whether they might not have been, you know, doing nothing wrong, but they kids like at 17, you probably look at the cop and be like, uh, well, uh, and then, but you just young, you just young, you dumb and you immature. But the same way those cops close ranks around, they, they people, when they do bad stuff, we do the same thing. Like Joey out here doing whatever Joey shouldn't be doing. But the first thing we do is free Joey. Yo, Joey just shot somebody. Joey need to go to jail. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and 
I don't understand that too because a lot of times those people we're doing harm to ourselves. Our community are doing harm to ourselves. So you taking like like you like you said, if you taking Joey's side saying free Joey, what about the person that looks like you that he just killed? You know what I mean? Yeah. What about the person he looks like you that just that he just shot? Like, why is there no concern for for that or that person? Because that could be you. You know what I mean? Just because he's your friend is another Joey out there that that ain't your friend that will catch you slipping when you <laughs> you know what I mean any, any given day. So why not have the same concern for victims that they do for their friends when they are, are like are offenders in terms of crime? But that's that's just natural self preservation. Like if you got a a brother and your brother did something wrong, first thing you're gonna do is try to defend your brother. You right. may try to handle it with your brother the way you want to handle it with your brother, but you don't want nobody else to. Right, right. Your brother does something dumb. You, first thing you'll be like, yo, you're going to tell everybody, yo, sorry, it's cool. Let me handle it. I got it. But sometimes that reaction is just that is not enough. Especially when yeah, you're on a level yeah, of no. interacting <laughs> with the police and that kind of stuff. That situation could be better. But I also think to go back to that is, um, the the main thing I think the problem is, and I, I say this in the book is, and I had a, um, a friend of mine talking to him. He actually said this. The problem we have with the police is, as a black community, there was never any trust built up with the community, with the cops, mm. between the community and the cops. So we have, so from the times of slave days to the times of just the cops beating us for no reason to to now, there was never no trust built up. So. White people trust the police. Black people still look at the police like, I'm going to call you if somebody breaks into my house, but I don't, other than that, I'm not really dealing with y'all. Right, right. And that's just because history, over history, there has never been no trust built between the two communities. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss an episode of the Fiction Addiction Podcast by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Now, back to the show. So in 2020, in, in your city, in Philly, just to focus on a small, uh, I say small demographic, like it's a freaking one of the biggest cities. <laughs> um, just to focus on Philly right now, how could that trust be rebuilt? Or not, if, if it wasn't there, obviously it's not getting rebuilt. How can it be built? Um. I think, and that's the, one of the reasons I wrote that book. I think any anytime you're trying to build trust, whether it's between two big things like the police and a city like Philadelphia, or for something as simple as you and your wife, there needs to be communication. And there's to be honest communication. And when you're truly communicating, when one side is talking, the other side is listening and not listening to answer or listening to you know, come back with something, listen and really listen and understand. Mm. Like, uh, what was it, maybe a month ago when Malcolm Jenkins said what he said about the um, police, about the FOP? Did you hear about that? No, what did he say? So he basically said, um, when we pick a new commissioner, we need to have a commissioner that is um, independent from the FOP. And, and then the guy that runs the FOP call them all kinds of bums and you're not even from this city and you don't belong here. And <laughs> so that reaction that he had did nothing to build the trust. Or if we go all the way right. back to when Trump was elected, the FO, the national FOP endorsed Trump. But mm -hmm. Philadelphia, the Philadelphia FOP, and you talk to the Philadelphia cops, the majority of them, especially the minority cops, was not trying to hear that. The black uh the black FOP call, because I don't know exactly what they called themselves. They came out with a statement that said, we do not want this put on us. We had nothing to do with that. Right. So I think you just need, there needs to be uh, a constant communication and there needs to be some, I mean, Philadelphia is just humongous. So I don't, I really don't know what they can do more than what they're doing. I mean, we got PAL, we got the, um, the police do a lot of outreach. And a lot of it don't get publicized. Maybe they need to publicize yeah. more of it, and maybe yeah, at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I, to be truthful, I don't, I don't know what they can do. Because to be truthful, most of the people that appreciate the cops is not the people is 
I, I, I mean, I don't know. What, what do you think we they could do? Uh, uh, <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. It, it's it, it's it's so many factors in uh their the department. It's so many factors in policing in general because when we look at some of this these things that go on, um. It, it, it's hard to diagnose it because we look at a lot of these situations and some of them we look at aren't even in, aren't even in our own city, let alone state. Mm-hmm. So we're like, we're seeing something online and you're like, how the hell is that happening? How the hell is that uh, going on? How they get away with that? But you're not, thinking you're in Philadelphia where it's very diverse compared to a place like Nevada. You know what I mean? Where, right. where, where people are there are going through a whole different type of uh, interaction with police that, that you may not have because there is more diversity here. Because I would say Philadelphia, even though Philadelphia has a, a like the numbers, right? The percentage wise is probably not that high in terms of minority officers, but there is it's still a lot. Like we talk about minorities, Philadelphia has everything: Asians, Indian, Blacks, mm-hmm. Latinos. Like they got so they got every nationality of officer. You, it's like the NYPD, same way. Um, and the leadership has been minorities for the most part. You know what I mean? You had Charles Ramsey, mm-hmm. you had uh, Richard Ross, and now you have uh, Commissioner Outlaw, who's coming in from Portland. Um, black female. Black female, young black female. I think she's only in her forties. Uh, I feel bad for her, honestly, because I don't think she understands what she's getting herself into. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope she do too. Yeah, you know what I mean? We, we, it, it is, and I, I didn't even realize Portland was that small. The department, I thought they were bigger than that. It was like I think I saw like less than nine hundred cops, and she's coming to a city that has like seven thousand cops. You know what I mean? And going to try to control and fix a lot of the internal issues, and then. Um, cause they, they, Philly is having a lot of like sexual harassment and, and stuff going on inside the department. Yeah. Um, but they also like 13 bodies already in 2020, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like you, you, you got this woman coming in into like a storm inside the department and then on the street. So she got to deal with so many problems. I don't know how you do it. Like, you know what I mean? Even if if I'm if I'm her, I don't even know how you do it because you got to basically get rid of the whole department and start from scratch if you want to if you wanted to be your way, if you wanted to be right, you know what I mean? And you can't do that. Um one well, of the I things you, I don't Hmm. No, I was going to say I don't think you can ever control a city like Philadelphia or any major right. metropolitan city. It's it's over a million people here. Yeah. So that's going to be, but some of the things we need to fix that would fix part of these problems is first you need to start with just with education. We need to get the schools fixed in Philadelphia. We need to get these kids. Definitely. Like, um, I I got friends who go, who kids go to, I'm going to just use this for an example. Um, Penn Charter High School. Every kid that goes there has to take two, extracurricular activity, whether it be play foot, play two sports or play the band or play a sport or do something. They do that to make sure that these kids' hands ain't idle. Mm. So why is it that in Philadelphia, one of the, we got we still got schools with a best with as best as the kids can go to school. Right. Kids if we could get the kids educated and keep them off the street. Half of the problems that we have now go away. Right. There's no reason a bunch of 10-year-olds is, you know, acting a fool in Center City. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> we need to get the kids educated and keep the kids busy. Like, I, so besides writing, I also coach. I coach football and I coach baseball. And a lot of those parents, those kids, they don't get in no trouble. But as soon as they stop playing sports, or as soon as they stop doing all the other stuff, when they when they got free time on their hands, that's when all the bad happens. Right. So if we can fix the school, get these kids educated, and then keep them busy, 
keep them with their hands in something positive. That'll fix a lot of the woes we got. And then at the end of the day, even if a lot of a lot of the bad happens just because people are trying to feed themselves. Mm-hmm. So if we can find a way to, I mean, I don't know how you combat that. I, I mean, that's, that's, you know, a podcast for an hour or two ain't going to fix that, but we got to find a way yeah. <laughs> to keep, we got to find a way that most kids get into criminal activities because they, most kids ain't doing it because they want the newest sneakers and the, I mean they that comes part of it. Most of them do that because they don't got no lights on. Yeah, they gotta eat. They 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 fridge is empty. So they like, all right, I'm 12 years old and I'm struggling. Only way I'm gonna get it at 12 is to go get it. Right. So but and if a, we know and a lot of times those kids uh they get they're so mature at that age because they know their parents don't have it. So they don't even want to bother their parents because they know they don't have it. So they're trying to help out in their own way. You know what I mean? So that's mm-hmm. the crazy dynamic of that, that situation too. So, uh, but to answer your question I, 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 about the police and how can we fix it? I don't know how, I don't know how you fix a, that kind of problem in a city this large. Mm-hmm. I mean, do people got to do more of what they're doing? But it's going to take. It's not going to take just the police. It's going to take the police, and it's going to take the parent, and it's going to take you know, it's going to take every organization in the city to keep these kids, you know, without idle time on their hands. Right. One of the things I I do think they they need to improve on. They need to look at is um placement. You know what I mean? Because I, I saw in the I saw in the uh, in the book the one conversation the cops are having with each other, or like the difference between them and the suburbs, and they don't go through what we go through, and you know what I mean. So the one thing I would say about the suburbs is, you go to a a suburb department, those guys are there for their whole career. You know what I mean? Um. So say you get promoted, say you got a, a cop on the street, learning the streets, and learning the community. He gets promoted to sergeant. Where is he at in the same community in the suburbs? You know what I mean? Yeah. So he gets promoted to lieutenant. Where is he at? The same community with the same people. Philly, for some reason, I don't know why they do it this way, but you'll have a cop working in like one district in West Philly. They get promoted and all of a sudden they ship to North Philly for for, for some reason. You know what I mean? And I, well, and I understand they have transfers, but the, the department does that for some reason to fill voids and things like that. So I think if they if they looked at that and tried to keep people in the community and, and you have cops literally watching kids grow up, they will have that relationship with the kid growing up. Because if you spend, like I said, what's the average time a cop spends in well, well, at certain cops, what, five to 10 years in one the district and then they go to another one for five, five more years and they go to a, a unit, you know what I mean? So where is the, I think that's where, where the suburbs, their community has a better uh, com, um, relationship with their departments because they literally see officer so-and-so from the moment he walks in to the moment he retires in the same, the same streets. You know what I mean? I, I think it's easier in the suburbs though, because you only got this little township that you got to worry about. Right. Oh yeah. If you, if you were a beat cop and, and you in the 15th and you want to and you want to get promoted to sergeant, but it's no room or it's no placement in your district to be a sergeant. You got to go somewhere else. Right. Right. So, I mean, again, I, I'm not a cop, so I don't know all the ins and outs of that. But I think that has a lot to do with it. People just want to advance their career. And if not a place here, then I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah definitely. Whereas in the suburbs, you go from sergeant to lieutenant or however it works. You in the same neighborhood because it's the only neighborhood. And You're I, right, and so that's me, all y'all got. <laughs> <laughs> and let me say this too, because I had a cop tell me this: like, part of the part of the problem is perception. So we hear about all of the bad stuff that happens in Philadelphia, but Philadelphia got a million people in it. You oh, only yeah. hear you only hear about you know, or you see it on news. Uh, there's, there's this bothers me to no end. Something happens in whatever suburb 
And then you get the old lady that says, well, that never happens in this neighborhood. Well, it's only 10 of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> like, just the, the odds of it happening when you got a million people compared to the odds of it happening when you got a thousand people, it's just the numbers is going to tell you that it's going to happen more often in, in Philadelphia than it is going right. to be in some suburb. Not knocking the suburbs, you know. More power. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you, you still coaching? Yeah, I um, coach Mount Airy Bantams football. We made it to the chip Shout this year, lost, lost in the chip. I'm still heartbroken over that, but. Who y'all lose yeah. to? Uh, I don't remember the blue team. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forgot. Uh, uh. So yeah, I coach football, coach baseball. Up Mount Airy too. So, um, what got you started in coaching? My son. Um, uh, my first year, my son turned six. Uh, I take him up to the field. I'm looking around like, yo, this. I says that my neighbor was one of the guys that ran the organization. I say to him, yo, like your coaches ain't right. I didn't like what was going on. He says to me. You know how to play. He said, you know football? I said, yeah, I played in high school. I know what I'm doing. He was like, well, then don't complain, coach. I was like, yeah, right. all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and my son don't, my son a little older now. He don't play football no more, but I kept, I kept doing it. Me and my, um, my, one of my other coaches, we've been together for so long. We just like hooked at the hip now. But for me, I keep doing it. Just that's my way to give back. Mm. So. For them two hours we coaching those kids during the week or those couple of hours, I know them kids ain't getting into no trouble. Right. And then we we tell the kids, like, look, you gotta have good grades. You wanna play, you gotta have good grades. You wanna do this? And we always use the older kids as examples. Like, look, look at look at uh look at Noah. Noah starting at Ryan. You wanna do that? This is what this is what you can be. Or look at this guy. This guy made it to the NFL. He started right here where you at. And that helps. I mean, hopefully that helps keep them on it. I mean, it don't work out for, for every kid, but hopefully that helps keep them on the straight and narrow, or at least straight and narrow as they can be. All right. So how do you as a coach, because my son, he he played football. He played for Eni for, for a couple of years. Um, Bring him over. And I know how <laughs> and, and I know how important um, the coaches were in terms of, and I don't know about it. Other sports are different when you got like soccer and stuff like that, but football was so disciplined. Um, and I know how, how big of an impact the coaches were like another parent, you know what I mean? Something happened in school. Mm -hmm. You, you, you straight tell them like, Oh yeah, he was acting up and you. And they were like another parent. How do you as a coach combat the, and, and with the parents alongside the parents, because most of them are doing the same thing, trying to help these kids. How do you combat, the peer pressure in the environment of kids who aren't into anything. Like, like you said, the idle time, how do you keep your kids that are on your team to stay focused and not fall victim to an influence from kids that have the idle time that, that aren't doing anything, but getting in trouble. I mean, we can only do so much. So we can only, only got them for a certain amount of time. We only got them. So that other time we try and instill certain like you said, we try to instill certain discipline in them. We also try to show them. This is the way I try to explain it to kids and it, older kids. You only, let's say, you lucky enough to live to you sixty, right? Mm -hmm. So you only in school till you eighteen. Let's just say twenty. That's only a third of your life. So are you going to mess up part of your life? This early part of your life for the rest of your life? Are you going to do something dumb? Like, do you really want to go to jail at 15 and you're only 15 years old and you want to spend 40 years in jail? Right. That's, you know, twice as long as you've been alive. Or do you want to do this? We also try and give them like the, the you know, national media and stuff like this. They, and especially in school, schools don't, teach some of the things we teach them. We try and show them, like, look, here's somebody that looks like you that made it. I tell all the kids, 
one of the assignments we, because we will give sort of like homework. One of the things we tell the kids is, I want you to go home and look up the guy that runs um, American Express. Look at the CEO of American Express. Come back, tell me what's his name the next day. They go home, look it up, Google it. Oh, it's a black man. It's a black man that run American Express, one of the biggest credit card companies in the world. Huh? Or, you know, besides the, you know, the Harriet Tubman's and the Malcolm X's and the Martin Luther King's, the, you know, the same four or five people they already know. Let's give them other examples of uh, what you can be. So take right. the Mount Airy Bantams. Um, DJ Moore plays for uh, Charlotte Panther. He came out of the Mount Airy Bantam playing the NFL. We try and use him mm. as an example. Or we use, we got a ton of kids that's playing in college right now that these kids know. Look at this kid. Um, there's a couple of kids from Shelton and a couple of kids that went to, um, that go to Wood, that came up through the Bantams, that all got full rides that's going to play in college next year. Mm. So we try to tell them, look, you have one of two choices. You can go this route over here, it's, and that route, only one of two things is going to happen to you. You're going to get killed or you're going to go to jail or you can, you want to ball, you know, all these kids, they like all the flashy stuff. And, you know, like if you really want to ball, this is how you do it. Educate yourself, go to school, become a CEO. I don't, I don't want you to be a worker no more. Right. Go start your own business. Go be like this guy or go be like this guy or go be like this guy. And we try and give them positive role models they can look up to that they can see in themselves. And at the end of the day, we can only do but so much. Like you said, it got to be a buy-in from the coaches. It got to be a buy-in from the parents also. So I know it's a cliche saying, but it really takes a community. It takes everybody. Like if my son did something wrong, I know if one of these other parents seen it and it, he knows that if they call me, it's going to be a problem. And I don't got a problem right. with none of those parents checking my son. Because they're not doing it out of nothing but love. Like, I don't need you and no trouble. Right. And and you, you, you from here, so you know, one of the problems we had when crack hit was we lost a whole generation of parents. And one of my, oh, yeah. my man, my man said all the time, he was like, the biggest problem we had with the result of that was we lost all of the old heads. So, you know, as a, as a kid, at a certain point, you start tuning out your parents. But you will listen to other people. You, If I tell my son something and then he go and he hear from one of his old heads on the block or wherever, and they say the exact same thing I said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean more because it's coming from them and it's just not me. Right, exactly. So when we lost that whole generation of parents, we lost all of them people trying to, you know, spit wisdom to these kids. We lost all of that. So when they tuned out their parents, all they heard was the nonsense. All he seen was the flashy stuff, not knowing what that's going to lead to. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think we can get that back? Or do I you think even it's think low. it's back? The old head. It, it's, it's coming back. It's, I, it's different now. I think, like you said, like what you're doing, what all these other people are doing, I think now when they see old head, when they see people now, they're looking at them like they see businessmen. And they see people making real moves. Like, oh. I can, I, that's attainable now. Those things that these people is doing, that you're doing and other people is doing, these younger kids are looking at that like, oh, he's, this guy did that? Oh, I can do that too. All right. Like I said, um, like I mentioned Penn Charter earlier. I say, I say that to the kids all the time. The headmaster of Penn Charter is a black guy. His wife is a mm. black woman. And I, and I, and again, I'm not trying to put no, shame on white people because I love white people too. I got plenty of friends that's white. I got plenty <laughs> of friends that's Asian and I'm not, I don't want to, you know, say nothing negative about them because I right, love them right. too. But when as a black, especially an inner city black kid, when you see another black person make it, it's like, ah, okay. It's just something else to look look up to. Like, ah, I can make it. It's just not, you know, Joe Biden or I don't know, some other famous white guy. They they don't they don't think that they can they can be they can reach that status. But when 
Obama did it or when even even the Jay-Z's of the world, he's a billionaire now. He's from Marcy Project. When they look at those right. people, they like, oh, all right, I can make it. And then they start to, once, once you believe you can make it, now you start to figure out, okay, how do I, what is my how plan I- on making it exactly? All right. Hell yeah. <laughs> Look, that's it. You know what I mean? Once you f- figure out the goal, you just figure out how to, how to execute it. <laughs> so, and so, it, it ain't, so, it ain't easy. <laughs> oh, not at all. Yeah, not at all. I think we need to teach them that too. I, yeah. I think we need to teach them along with the, with the, you know what I mean? Along with the, the, the status, you got to deal with the, 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 the struggles that come along, the, the hardships, the trials and tribulations, you know what I mean? And be mentally prepared to deal with that as well. Yeah. I think some of it, I think some of it is like, especially with social media, some of it is like so flashy. People don't show the real, you know what I mean? They don't show what's really going on behind the scenes. They don't show how hard it is to do some of these things. But like you said, it's not um, just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's unattainable. You know what I mean? So know you're going to go through these hardships, but know it's possible to still get through them and to work through them to still achieve your goals. I think that's important teaching the kids as well. So um, hopefully these youngins are getting that information from people out here because it's a difference maker, man. They, they, they basically got the world in their hands now with the technology and the, the uh, access to, to information It's like no excuses for the young kids to be out here messing up. Yeah, but they still kids. That's the one thing we, yeah. Oh yeah. They still need to be led. Like kids are still going to do dumb stuff because they kids. Just yeah, like we, we did it, we, we did. We did. We did. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't no 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 cameras around to, to, to yeah, show it, show that, it off. Yeah. We did the same dumb stuff. <laughs> imagine, uh, I couldn't imagine if it was a camera when I was a kid and some of the things, some of the dumb things I did that don't nobody know about. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So jumping back into the book, um, yeah. there was an important scene uh, that I was like, oh, that was deep. So in the story, um, the officers are speaking with a woman. They're on the porch. They're having a conversation. And one of her neighbors sees it. And he walks up and me- immediately checks on her. Hey, yo, you all right? Because he saw her with the cops. Um, that action is becoming more and more common now with everything that's going on. How, how important is that to um, not all communities, but specifically the black community, to be checking on people, to be... Um, ensuring that the police interactions are positive in, in, in a sense, because I see they got, they got even got a show coming out called cop watch or whatever, but you know what I mean? So that's a more focused, uh, um, action, uh, to a, to a different degree, but how important is it at the low level as well? I think it's very important. So like my papa always tell you when he was a kid, everybody in the neighborhood knew everybody. So everybody looked out for everybody, whether it was for the police or whether it was, you know, back then they was, my pop would tell you they was gang warring. They had no, this was before, you know, guns and everything, but everybody was fighting each other. And it was just a whole different, but the whole, the neighborhood looked out for the neighborhood. And when I was growing up, you know, I knew the people on my block. I knew a few other people, but now uh, don't nobody know nobody. Right. I, I walk on my dad block now. I don't, I don't. I know him. The next door, my next door neighbor is the guy across the street, and that's all he knows. Him, the next door neighbor. So no, he don't know nobody else <laughs> on the block. That's crazy, right? But now with these cameras, it's not just the police interaction. It's any kind of interaction. Everything. I think it goes both ways. Is the camera makes people think before they do things. When you flash a camera in front of somebody's face, now they know they're being recorded, so they know they can't lie themselves out of a situation. Both sides. I think every cop should also have a um, should have also have those those body cams because not only does it protect the cop, it protects the other person because now both of them know they're getting recorded, so they know they can't lie right. about. It. You know, it can't be. So when you. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, it can't be 30 years ago when somebody, a cop did something to somebody or somebody did something to a cop and it, they just straight lie. Like, I didn't do it. So, like, right. 
all those years ago, people outside of our community thought police brutality wasn't real until the whole Rodney King thing. Mm -hmm. And then it got real. Um, I forgot it was one of the Eagles. It was either Brian Dawkins or um, I think it was, it was either, I forgot, one of those Eagles. One of the Eagles told a story. He said he had an assistant, uh, white girl, privileged girl. She, she said when they was, when, when this, all of this police stuff was coming out, she didn't believe it. And she didn't believe it because she had never seen it. And when she said that to him, he was like, I understand where she's coming from because to her, it's not real because it's not real to her because it never happened. It never happened to her. It never happened to none of her friends. So she couldn't understand how it would happen to somebody else because the cops she knew wouldn't do things like that. Right. So that's, that's the good thing about the cameras is now we saying, okay, you can't lie no more. I got you on camera. You can't go to the, you can't go in front of the judge and be like, I didn't do that. Yeah, you did. It's right here. Same thing the other way. Same thing the other way. If, if you do something, hey, cop show up to court. I got it on camera. Here's what he did. Officer. I mean, judge, I'm not lying on this man. It is what it is. Now in 2020, we, we, we've seen, uh, a bunch of the police arrests, uh, a, a bunch of the police shootings leading to arrests, and and honestly, the, some of them are actually leading to um, charges, murder charges, with the exception of some of them. Um, that one where the girl was, the, the, the judge gave her the Bible and all that stuff, and now she's appealing yeah. her, her, her. Yeah. Besides that, but some of them are actually getting charged with murder. I know the guy, um, the one in Philly, with the guy that got shot in the back off the dirt bike. Um, that cop got charged with murder. Uh, do you see, is it now going in the right direction or, or what do you think about the, or do we still have the same issues now with those charges now being filed and things like that? Um, I think is is getting better, but I also think, so we were so far one way that I think it overcorrected way too far the other way. What I mean by that is, um, the cops was probably way too over aggressive before. Now, even though certain, I mean, even though we got these out, these one time incidents that are being charged, now the problem with the police is they so far the other way, they don't want to do nothing. They're afraid to do things. Mm. Right. Now you call the police, they're like, I'm not doing, I'm not going in there. I'm not doing that. That's, that's not my job. So I think we got to find the, the middle ground where the cops can be cops. But they can't, where they, but they don't go over the line. Like, it's no need if you a cop and it's no need to shoot somebody in the back. There's no need for that. You wasn't, you wasn't um, in fear of your life. But also at the same time, if you a cop, we need you to do your job. So I don't, I don't know what the middle ground is, but we got to find that middle ground where cops do their job without crossing the line. But also, mm-hmm. it's hard to be a cop. It's hard to. Oh, yeah, that's, oh, a, yeah. that's a hard job. Like, I don't know if I could do that job. You you see somebody <laughs> like how many times you guys see, like you just said, it's been 13 bodies already. It ain't January not even over. Right. Like that, like the dude that uh, was shooting at the cops. <laughs> and I, God bless his soul that he lived through that. Because I sure didn't think oh, he was yeah. coming out that house alive. Oh yeah, I, yeah. It was weird. Yeah, two of them in there. He's shooting. Yeah. He having a shootout with a hundred more outside, and then that was the day. Uh, Rick Ross. Well, the day before Rich Ro- Richard Ross retired, yeah. <laughs> which is <laughs> so, so. Um, yeah. But, that, but, that whole situation was weird, man. <laughs> but back to your original question, I think with the cops actually starting to be charged now, it's starting to. It's not even the being charged part. It's the being convicted part. Because we've had, right. just like the, the boy that, that choked the guy in New York that I can't breathe, he was charged, but we oh, let Eric him go. Garner. Yeah. Right. So now that cops is starting to be convicted of things, I think that tells them we're not invincible, we're not above the law. Right. Now, what do you think went wrong there? Because obviously, um, obviously the cops weren't... Uh, doing the convictions, they they, they, they they locked up the cops and, and it's left up to either a judge or jury. But even in some of these cases, they did have jury. So so they did have 12 people that sat there and said, 
oh no, nah, this cop is is innocent. What do you what do so, you think? I think part of the problem is most of the time when cops um, go on trial, they actually don't go on. They actually take uh, ju- uh, not jury. They just take trial by the judge. They don't go in front of a jury. So that's the first thing. They don't get tried by 12 people. Most of the time, yeah, the bench trial. when cops get off, they take a bench trial. The judge is letting them off. To me, that seems like a conflict of interest. And I actually had a friend of mine as a cop say the same thing. He said, what should happen is when cops get charged with something, it should be handled by outside people. People that don't got no affiliation with the cops, with the DAs, with the judges. With the mm-hmm. with the district with the district attorneys with none of that, let it hand be handled by outside people. That way, we can get we can get a that way the people can see that the process was fair. Because if if I'm a cop and I go on and I get a bench trial, I'm a Philly cop. I get a bench trial, even if I was innocent, it's going to look like I'm guilty. Because how many times I've been in front of this judge, or how many times has any All other right. cop? Been in front of this judge. Been in front of the judge. So even if he was innocent, it it makes him look guilty. So his thing was just take it out of the hands of the local jurisdiction. Get a national whatever panel of people to handle that situation. That way you can build some trust with the community. And you're like, we're not judging our own. We're not prosecuting our own. We're going to let outside people handle this and let it be fair. And then I think people will respect the process more. Because right now, until more bad cops start getting convicted, people still looking at the cops like, uh, he he gonna beat it somehow. Right. Just like the lady you said uh, that went into the wrong apartment. She only got 10 years for murder. <laughs> now, if that was straight, me or straight you. Straight murder. <laughs> if that was me or you, and I walked into somebody's house, and I shot them, and I killed them, I'm going to jail forever. Right. And either why life or the death penalty, you ain't get either one. <laughs> why does she get get it off easy? Because she's a cop. She had a hard day at work. We all had hard days at work. <laughs> I ain't go home and kill right. nobody. That man can't come exactly. home again. So, people still don't think the process is fair. I think it's getting there. It's just not there yet. All right, so an uncomfortable conversation. Um, you have book one out. You have book two. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's next in this series coming up? Um, I, I don't know. For that one, that's some um, heavy writing, those two books. So I think the next, I got a couple of other books coming out probably later this year that's a little less weighty. <laughs> so those are hard books to write. Those is hard because it's hard looking at the tr- uh, cert- those situations and trying to, you know, present it in a way that's truthful and accurate and trying to show both sides. And that, that I don't know, that's just some hard writing sometimes. So the next book's going to be a little more pop feeling, like <laughs> sci-fi or something. And I, right. when I, I'm, I'm going to probably go back to that I mean, not probably. I'm definitely going to go back to that, but another one of those probably won't come out till 2021. Damn. Okay. <laughs> so with the, with that heavy writing, that heavy content in there, um, a couple of the stories in the book, um, were deep, man. You know what I mean? You're talking about police shootings and not only them happening, them occurring from a community aspect, but you're diving into the family aspect of it in terms of grieving, uh, coping with reality, and then moving forward um, past that grief. How, like you said, it is heavy writing. How do you get that from to the pen and paper without, you know what I mean, without getting your emotions too wrapped up into it to the point where you know what I mean? You know how some things you can... It's like watching this, a movie about slavery. You get so emotional watching it, getting so angry. How do you stay balanced in terms of... Because it could have went either way. You know what I mean? 
This could have been yeah, in both so, the whole, <laughs> pointing fingers, but it wasn't. It, it was it was both sides, but it could have easily been a book saying how is this happening to our community and this, this, and this, but it wasn't. So how do you stay balanced put, putting these heavy stories out? So I'm going to answer that, those two questions separately. So the first thing is the emotional part of it, I, for me, I can't. So I can't get, I can't detach myself emotionally from it because even though those things don't happen to me or those stories were necessarily my story, those stories could have been my story. Oh, hell yeah, absolutely. Right? It could have been like, and this is from the guy I got pulled. So I know personally, I know what it's like to have the police point guns at you and you not know it's the police. I got pulled out. I had a brand, got a, had a brand new car. I'm at the corner of my mom's block. Ten cops run up on me and all black. I think they the stick up kids. I think they about mm. to get me. They, And then, and then while, a, while the one cop got his gun pointed at me, then I see, then he pulls out his badge and another cop turns around. I see police on the back. They tells me they thought they saw me shaking hands with somebody they thought was selling drugs. Thought. <laughs> they searched my car. I don't, huh. I'm not hustling. I'm, I'm really working. I'm working a nine to five. I'm not, I don't got no weed in the car, nothing. So they thought they, you know, so, but for those first, for that first minute before I realized they was the cops, I really thought they were the stick up kids. I really thought well, this was really about to go silent. So when I write, I really, me personally, I can't detach myself from what I'm, from what I'm writing. That's why I said, I probably don't be able to write another one of those books till, you know, I probably won't start writing it till the end of this year and it won't be out till next year. Because for me, I can't separate the two. Mm. So I get real heavily involved. And the, the second part of this, how do I show it as balanced is because I know people on both sides. I don't know just, I'm not a cop, but I know police. Like I said, I got real good friends that's cops and I don't wish no harm to them or their families. So when I, I you when you know, when you hear a cop got shot just because he was a cop, I'm like, damn, that could have been my man. Right. Or that could have been, or like, and I know some female cops who that could have been one of them. And I don't wish no ill will on them because at the end of the day, 99% of cops nowadays is good, decent people that's just trying to make a living and trying to make their neighborhood better. I'm not saying they all like that, but the majority of them are. And, but I also know people that's been on the other end of situations that probably shouldn't happen. Me being one of them, like it was no reason for them cops to, to point guns at me. Right. I ain't do nothing wrong. Also, they didn't like when they, when, you know, they say we, we said we was cops. No, nah, they didn't say they was cops. I didn't know they was cops until, until you saw it until a minute later. That's crazy. Right. When they, and a lot, when and they a lot first in a minute. Me, <laughs> yes. Like if, Imagine if I had my if I had a gun on me, and right. I just thought that I thought they was a stick up kids, and I would have shot one of them. I'd be in jail forever. Right, defending yourself basically. That's, that's what it would have been. Right, <laughs> but that's not the way it would have went down in court. Right, exactly. I would have been, you know, Derek Marrow shot a cop. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. And so, then and they would have had the narrative that oh, oh, we did everything we could. We identified ourselves, and when when the truth was, truth is they didn't. I mean, if people going to say, you know, a minute, a minute, that's no time. But uh, it, you, how much, you know how much can happen in 60 seconds? Oh, absolutely. I could have reached for my gun, bust that one of them. They shot me dead. Easily. And that would have been, but what, 20 luckily, seconds? <laughs> Literally. Yes. <laughs> so when I write, I, I can't write. I get emotionally invested in what I'm writing because I also needed to be truthful. I'm not writing up, this is, none of this is fiction. I'm not writing up no, you know, this is not some movie that some, no, nah, these are real life things with real life consequences for real life people. Mm. So I, me personally, I get heavily invested in what I write because I needed to be truthful, but also needed to be, I write those books to be a learning experience for the people on both sides. Right. I need, I need the cops to understand that this is the way the neighborhood sees y'all. Whether it's your fault or it's not your fault, this is the narrative that you guys have at this moment. And I need the people on the other side to understand 
all right, yeah, that one cop might have done this, but you wasn't there. How many times that cop then carried a, a, a kid bleeding to the hospital? Mm-hmm. How many finger? How many times cops then put their fingers in, in bullet holes trying to save kids' lives? With no, you know, not thinking twice, not thinking, oh, this kid might got a disease, I don't want to get this. Nah, they trying to save that kid's life and they rush him to the hospital. Or if you a person, and somebody break into your house, what's the first thing you're going to do? Right. You're going to call the cops. Hell yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not trying to point no, no blame at nobody. I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm trying to show both sides. This is the reality of the situation that we're in now. Now what can we do to make it better? Because if we don't conversate, if we don't talk about it, it's never going to get better. Oh, not at all. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a little older than some people. So if you go back to, you know, the old G.I. Joe cartoons, first thing, but they say at the end, no one is half the battle. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> so if I don't know it's a problem or I don't know what the problem is, we can't address it. Now, we can have an honest conversation and talk about it and you see where I'm coming from and you see where the other side is coming from then maybe we can address these issues. So, based on that scenario, was, what was the uh, result of that um, that, that situation when they, where they jumped up on you? Was there any was there any nothing. repercussions on them for doing what they did? No, nothing. Nothing happened. They they pulled me over. They I don't know who, I don't know who they thought I was or what they thought was going down. They searched my car. They pulled me out. They let me go. Told me to go about my business. That's what I did. I went about my business. I wasn't asking for no names, no badges. I'm like 20 years old. Happy to be alive. I, <laughs> I'm just like all right, cool. I went about my I went about my way. I didn't like the situation, but at the end of the day, nothing happened to me. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't, they ain't shoot me, they ain't arrest me, they ain't beat me up. None of that happened. For a, for a minute, I'm like, man, well, I got guns pointed at me, and I'm thinking y'all somebody else. But when it was all said and done, it was just a situation I don't wish nobody to go through. But when it was all said and done, yeah, it shouldn't have happened the way it happened, but it was a, it was a done deal a, after that. And the crazy part about that whole story was that your mentality from it and, and most people, and it goes back to uh, you mentioning um, the story about we have Brian Dawkins, one of them and them, not un- their, their assistant, not understanding what they go through. Somebody else that doesn't look like you, that's not from your community would have been, would, would hear this situation and be enraged at, at the result that nothing was happening. And you were just sent on your way. Like, how the hell do you, you know what I mean? Like them hearing what you went through would be ridiculous to them. But for us, you know, for us, stuff like that, that's, that's like normal. Like how many people have been through that situation and normalized it when that's not a normal situation to go through? You had a gun pointed at you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And it, it probably would have been different if it was happening in, you know, 2020. I would have had a camera in my car, right. you know, I could have, I could have, you know, I would have had video proof of what happened. But if I go and press the back then, if I go and press the point, nothing's going to happen because nobody's going to believe what I said. Right. All the cop is going to say, is, we had, we had our, we had our stuff with the police word on it. We had our badges out. He had, he, he should have known it was us. We, and we, you know, we said we're the police. I have no proof to say that they did. Mm. So back then it was nothing. Even if I wanted to do something, nothing would have happened. Right. It would have been my word against, you know, 12 cops or 10 cops, however many it was. That's crazy. So at that, at that point in time, you just got to move on. Now, if it was today and I had a camera, go back to your previous question, and I had recorded the whole thing, then maybe I'd do something about it. So as a, as a father... Is there, do you prepare your, are you, you say you got it. How old is your oldest? I got three. So, um, two in college, one in high school. Oh God. That's every, two. that's every single one of them. Like, was, so as a, fa- <laughs> as a father, like knowing what you went through, knowing what's going on in these streets, how do you prepare your children for, how did you prepare them? How are you preparing them daily to deal with not only uh, law enforcement, but also the streets, people that look like them or people that their age that are doing nonsense. How do you prepare them for the streets and for having, and for police encounters? 
So the thing with the police is, I always told my son, don't be in the wrong. Or not just my son, all my kids. Don't be in the wrong. Like, don't, if you're drinking, don't drive. And I'm telling you, you're not, you shouldn't even be drinking because you ain't old enough. But if you do, don't, don't get in the car. If you doing something you shouldn't be doing behind the wheel, don't drive. So if you happen to get pulled over by the police for whatever reason, as long as you, as long as you're, you got all your, you know, your ducks in the line, it won't be a problem. I don't care if the cop holler at you. I don't care, I don't care if the cop curse at you. None of that stuff. At the end of the day, I need you alive. Right. So if a cop pull you over, keep your hands on the steering wheel. Don't make no sudden movements. Go through the whole nine. Make it as easy for the cop as you can. He asks you for your paperwork. Before you move your hands, I tell him, tell the cop that everything's in the glove compartment. I'm going to get it out the glove compartment. Then wait for the cop to tell you it's okay. Then you go do it. You make it as easy for that cop as you can, and it'll be easy on you. I'm not saying that that's the right the right thing for the cop to do or for the cop to be an a-hole to you or for the cop. Because most of the time, most of the situations is not like the situation I went through. They pull you over, you give them your paperwork, they send you on your way. But don't give a cop a reason to become an a-hole. Right. And as long as you legal and as long as you're not doing nothing wrong, situation shouldn't get out of control. And I'm not saying that it won't. Because, you know, you got the Sandra Bland things and the but if there's a million traffic stops, you know, all but a hundred of those traffic stops is going to be fine if the people is legit. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, and my blessing, I mean, my hope for you is that you're not one of them hundred. And if something happens in those hundred, then uh, we got to handle that as it comes. But your interaction with the cop is don't get a cop no lip. Don't get a cop. Just deal with the situation and go about your way. That's what I tell my kids because right, wrong, or indifferent, I need you to be alive. I don't need you to be right. And the same thing with, with, with the kids with, with the street. I tell my kids all the time, like, look, you don't got to win. You don't got to win an argument. If some, I'm a grown man. If I step on somebody's shoe or somebody step on my shoe or whatever, like, think of it this way. You really want to go to jail for somebody stepping on your sneakers. Right, <laughs> exactly. You're really going to take a life you really going to take a life or get your life taken over, a, over somebody stepping on your sneakers or you bumping into somebody? Like, nah, I bump into somebody. I need you to do this. I tell my son, I need you to do this. My fault. I apologize and keep it moving. Because that will diffuse everything. But when you're trying to play Mr. Tough Guy, like, I, what you step on my sneaker for, homie? Uh, all that. Then that stuff escalates to something that don't need to be. You don't got to win that. You don't got to yeah, win that. that Just <laughs> apologize. Even if... Even if you're right, apologize, keep it moving, because guess what? You're alive to breathe the next day. And same thing I tell um, the girls about boys. Like, look, that boy should never put a hand on you. And if he does, then he's going to have a problem with me <laughs> and the rest of the males right. in my family. <laughs> but I also don't need you to put yourself in a situation where a guy would even think about putting his hands on you. Like, it's no reason for you to be, if, if, if you, if you done with this dude, Wait. whoa, there's no reason for him to call him all kinds of MFs and, and talk about his mom, yeah. <laughs> all his nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you do all of that, there's no reason for him to put his hands on you. But why take it there? Yeah, he's going to be wrong. And yeah, that situation would have to be dealt with after the fact. But now you making the situation, just leave. Just leave. Yeah. Hell yeah. It ain't worth it sometimes, man. So I, it ain't worth it none of the time. Like any situation where you could lose your life over something dumb, it ain't right. worth it. And I, I try to tell my kids all the time: in those situations, you don't. I don't need you to win. I, I don't need you to win the argument, or I don't need you to be the be, be the biggest guy or to be the baddest guy. I need you to win by leaving. Now, when you you said you dropped the first uh, uncomfortable conversation. A woman from Texas reached out to you. Um, so her brother, her brother, her and her mm -hmm. brother enjoyed the book, and you need to write a second one. You came out with the second one. What was their reaction when you when they got the when they read the second one? Um, 
So I heard from the, haven't heard from the brother. I know he read it, but I haven't got his like full reaction. His whole thing was, all I want you to do is show both sides mm. of the story. That's all, that's all he asked for. He was like, because he's a black guy too. And he was like, I know everything ain't perfect. He said, I don't even mind if y'all talk bad about us. That's not what he said. He said, I don't mind if y'all show the bad. He said, as long as it's truthful and as long as you show the other side also, right. I'm good. He said, his, they, his problem is when people show the bad, like we don't do nothing good. Like all it is is these, we just terrible cops. He was like, as long as you show both sides, we good. And actually, um, the very last, I wrote the book and I reached out to the lady. I let her read it. And then um, she gave me some point or she gave me some ideas. So the, at the very end of the book, there's like the, uh, the, the lieutenant in the book re- talks to the camera for like right. a minute. So most of that was directly from mm, her. That's dope. She she gave me some ideas and I and I put that together just as a like as a thank you to her, but also as like let this cop have a last word because it starts the books you you see mm-hmm. I mean you read it but the start the book starts out with the cops talking yep. to themselves and then the neighborhood gets involved and then the cop at the end gives his little speech and he tries to you know show both sides also like I understand we got some things we need to do better. But we also are this. And then I got another, another friend of mine as a cop. He always says, if you think it's so bad, join it and make mm-hmm. it better. So that's how I ended it. And those was, he tells me that all the time. If, you know, we always hire police, Philadelphia. He a Philadelphia cop. He was like, we hire him right now. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you don't, if you want to, if you want to help us fix the pr- if you want to help us fix the problem, be a part of fixing the problem. Right. Come join us or do something to help us fix the problem. Don't just talk about. It. That's deep. That's real. <laughs> so this, so this book, um, I know you know. I'm I'm pretty sure people tell you all the time. So many avenues you can go with this. Um, where do you see it going? Because it could be, it can be turned into a visual. It can be turned into um, something uh, less, I guess, detailed for children as well, like younger children to get an idea of. So where do you see it going? Because it has so much potential to go in different avenues. So, I mean, hopefully one day I could record them, especially the first one, because the first uncomfortable conversation is just two people. So I actually want to shoot that one first because that would be a lot easier to do. Um, But hopefully one day, like, you know, if I had all my wildest dreams and all of that, for me, what I would love for it to see it, you know, become is like a Netflix series Mm. or something like that, where you take different groups and have sit people down in a room and have real honest conversations and then what can we do to fix these conversations? I mean, to fix these topics that we're talking about, like you asked me. So that's what I would love to see. Cause it's not just black versus white or the police versus this. We got a ton of problems that if people would just sit down and have an honest conversation, we right. could fix like the education system. And like, how is it that when you get, when you go to school, the only history they teach you is, uh, uh, European history for the most part. They don't teach you black history. They don't teach us. They don't teach our kids that we come from kings and queens. They don't teach you about, you know, uh, this guy conquering on woolly mammoths or right. elephants. They don't teach you about that history. Also, if you're in school, how, how, how are we in 2020 not being taught financial education right. in school? Exactly. So that's what I would love for this series to become is uh, 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 sort of a documentary or a series where we discuss, you get different groups of people discussing different topics. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be dope. <laughs> that'd be real dope. So how... how but I, no, I, would only, I would only have one caveat. It got to be honest. Like, yeah, nothing, nothing made no, up, no, nothing, for the nothing, cameras. nothing <laughs> fake. 
No. Nah. People trying to be politically correct, so they're not giving truth. Like you said, it's not going to be truthful. It's going to be whatever you think I want to hear or something like that. <laughs> exactly. So how has the book been received by uh, members of the community? Um, I haven't got, I haven't received any negative feedback so far. Um, the first one, I got a little, the first one, it was just a white man talking to a black man. So I got a little feedback saying, you know, that's not enough people in the conversation. There's no women. There's no this. There's no this group. So that's why the second book, I tried to expand the number right. of people. So it's a little more diverse. Um. So far, so good. I haven't, I haven't, you know, knock on wood, I haven't received any, uh, I haven't received anything but positive reviews yeah. so far. Now, how, how has it been received by members of like law enforcement? Um, I know you, obviously you got friends that are in law enforcement. Have you, have there, has you been able to reach out to people outside your friends that are in law enforcement to get those conversations started with them? Yeah, uh, I've, I've I've had a couple of, I mean, uh, hopefully in the next month or two, I might take a trip. Like the the one the one guy, uh, he's from Texas, so I may take a trip down there talk to talk to them. There's another guy that reached out to me. I may, I don't know. We try to work some things out, but I may. This may allow me to sit down with a with at least two different groups of officers and show and talk about some of the things that's in the book and talk about the way the community sees them. Cause I think for at least for some of the law enforcement officers that, that read it, it was, even though they knew it, it was eye opening just to see those truths mm. on paper. Cause I don't think, I don't think some people thought it was as bad as it is. And in some places, some places it's worse than Philadelphia. Some places it's way better than Philadelphia. I think we were in the middle. But I think it was eye-opening for individual officers to see the way people look right. at them. Yeah, it's definitely a conversation starter. It's definitely, it's definitely something that every I think it should be in every it should be in the damn police academy. You know what I mean? Reading a book like this, so they know <laughs> what they're getting themselves into. They know what the stigma is, and they know what they need to go out and change. You know what I mean? So yeah. But I also think it was good for people that non-police officers, non-law enforcement to see what those officers go through on a day-to-day basis. Because all, you know, all we see is uh, you got, you know, Joe officer here harassing this person or, but they don't see all the other things or you only see what your interaction is or you only see what somebody posts online. Right. So if you go look up, you know, stuff about the police, it's 50 bad stories. And then one, one good one <laughs> that you got to dig through to find. <laughs> right. And I mean, but that's just the way yeah, the media works. Media. The, you know, good stuff don't <laughs> right. sell. So I think both ways, it was eye opening for people to see the other side. At least that's the feedback I've gotten so far. So what what genre do you prefer writing in? Because you got the you got the, the sci fi fantasy, and then you have the um, truthful narrative fiction. So what? And and you had the poetry. So you know, uh, so I I don't really write poetry anymore. Oh, you stop? And I'm not knocking <laughs> it. I so like that book that I wrote. That was probably you know that was years and years of one poem here, one poem there. I just had so much that I was able to put it together. So I just don't write enough of that to put another book together. But so I write the other things just because long in my mind, long term, I can see like I can't put a poem on film. Like, I mean, maybe you could, but I, I wouldn't know how to I wouldn't even know how to conceptually do that. But I know like a un, I can take this uncomfortable conversation. And put it on film. And, you know, you pull it up on Netflix and you can see just what right. I wrote. So long term, I think I'm going to probably stick to more of those kinds of things because it has the potential for me to film it and it become bigger and spread the word and, you know, monetarily help me. <laughs> a little bit. 
So what's so what's next for you? Uh, so next thing, uh, I got two books coming out probably the middle of this year. The middle, so summertime, fall. One is um, so when you watch Marvel, right, or you watch superhero movies. The problem with superhero movies, whether it be Marvel or DC, is when all of that stuff was written, there were very few non-white characters. So there's no Asian superheroes, and there's very few black superheroes, and um, there's very there's even very few women superheroes. So nine out of ten is you know white male superheroes, mm-hmm. right? So the one book I wrote. Uh, it's called Xavier Max Kennedy. So in that book, um, this is a kid who is granted like superhero powers. So it's a it's a superhero book, but it's not a comic book. So it's a long, you know, ninety thousand word superhero story. So I'm writing book two to hey. that. So that should be done hopefully this summer. And then I got a new book. Uh, it's like space fiction, sci-fi type of like Star Wars, but not really Star Wars, just Star Wars because it just happens to be in space. <laughs> but even in those, so that'll be out this summer too. But even in those two books, what I always try to do is, even though, you know, it's fiction and the one book is like I'm targeted for like the Harry Potter middle grade age group. And the other book um, is like young adult age. I try and always, even though it's fiction and it's a story about superheroes and, you know, this space fighter and always try and stick in some things, some topics that are so in the, uh, the one about the kid with the superhero. So there's some things about, there's some things about family and there's some things about some trials and tribulations he has to go through. And in the other book, uh, there's a snuck into the story. There's a, uh, one of the characters is a young woman who was sold into bondage. Mm. So we, I try and always t- sneak in some real topics. So people, as they're reading this fiction and they're enjoying the story, they're learning as right. they go along without knowing yeah. that they're learning. So, and I just want to write for books for people that's not necessarily, you know, books are written for or about. Yeah, exactly. To give them some shine, give them something to relate to. So let's, um, exactly. So where can people reach out to you? Where can people just drop your handles, your social media, emails for people to reach out to you? And where can they find your books at? Uh, so easiest place to find the books. So, um, Derek Marrow.com, D E R R I C K M A R R O W.com. You can find the books there. Um, I'm also on Amazon. If you just Google my name, you'll see, um, all of the books come up there. Uh, they're both in hard copy and ebook. So if you got a Kindle or get the Kindle app for your phone, you can download them there. Um, also social media. Um, my Instagram is, and I need to change them all so they all the same, <laughs> but I've made them at right. so many different times. So my Instagram is, um, author Derek Marrow. My Twitter is D underscore Anthony underscore M Anthony being my middle name. And then, um, my Facebook is, uh, D dot Anthony dot M. So you can find me there or you can email me. Um, it's D E R A N T M A R at uh, gmail.com. So it's just the first three letters of my first middle and last name, but you can find me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. You can find me almost everywhere. I don't have Snapchat. I don't know how that works yet. <laughs> Never downloaded that, but you can find me everywhere else. All right, Derek Morrow, we appreciate you stopping by the Fiction Addiction Podcast. We appreciate your insight. Um, it was, we enjoy, I truly enjoyed this conversation, man. Appreciate it.
Ah, thank you for having me. It was much appreciated when you reached out to me. Definitely. We definitely got to do this again when the, when the next books drop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, if you got anything you want to share, you know, let me know. I'll support it. I'll put it out there on all my stuff, too, because I'm, you know, like you said, I'm hopefully I'm trying to, you know, spread myself. But also, as I spread myself, bring others along with me. So, you know, we can, as a community, definitely, can grow. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for joining us on the Fiction Addiction Podcast. Make sure you visit fictionaddictionpodcast.com for links on everything we talked about today, as well as awesome resources, additional tips, and fiction addiction merchandise.